So I'm going to start with an overview of kind of how we got here. But as a reminder for everyone here, we are presenting on a NYCHA's waste calculator. And we have folks from the Center for Zero Waste Design and from the Department of Sanitation who will also be talking about um, kind of the precedents for NYCHA's waste calculator. So how we got to this point, um, in 2019, NYCHA published the Waste Management 2.0 plan which outlined several strategies to achieve a pest and a litter-free NYCHA by 2025. That plan identified that more than 81% of our waste infrastructure and equipment were past its useful life and needed to be replaced and were a huge uh, cause for a lot of the litter and pests that were happening across NYCHA. Um, at the same time, we received $55 million in funds through the prior mayoral administration's neighborhood rat reduction program to replace some of that infrastructure, uh, namely our interior and exterior compactors at 64 of our developments in neighborhoods with the highest rat burrow densities, which I believe is probably a, an open data set that you all can investigate. Um, We've seen a significant improvement in the rat population at those developments as a result of this investment. And from that, we really pushed for additional investments and commitments um, that are then outlined in the published Pest and Waste Action Plan, um, with, uh, which is with NYCHA and the HUD Monitor and the City Capital Action Plan. These plans commit funds for NYCHA to make infrastructure investments throughout the remaining portfolio. And these plans commit over half a billion dollars for us to do that work. Um, that is a, a monumental amount of funding for NYCHA and for public housing. Um, and it really will help us update critical infrastructure for our residents and staff. Um, how we use those funds are really like these next steps and how do we holistically think about the different waste that's being managed. Um, so that's kind of getting us to where we are today and what we are thinking about when we're moving forward with these investments. So in 2021, we have the City Capital Action Plan approved and the funds ready to upgrade our infrastructure and rethink our waste management infrastructure across NYCHA. And through that, we really wanted to rethink about it in the sustainability agenda. Um, NYCHA issued a 2016 sustainability agenda and met a lot of the goals that we had outlined for the authority by 2021. And so we set out to set a new uh, series of goals for ourselves. Um, and a couple of goals that we have in the agenda specifically for waste management is how do we re-envision our waste infrastructure? To date, all of our waste infrastructure has been just for trash and managing trash. Um, but we know from the waste, man uh, waste characterization studies that there's a lot more than just garbage in our waste stream. Um, and so taking the funds from the city capital action plan, how do we actually think about addressing all of the different waste streams that we have? And what are creative solutions like pneumatic waste collection systems or other uh, containerized storage solutions that we can use um, with those funds? Um, how do we increase the capacity for effective waste management, like developing a waste calculator to estimate how much storage we actually need for each of these different materials? And how do we make sure that once we do create storage and tools to manage these other waste, materi waste materials, how do our staff get updated procedures um, and how are they taught about how to properly manage these different streams? And then once we have the infrastructure and the staffing procedures in place, how do we establish or start to establish a zero waste NYCHA program? Um, we need to be able to track our recycling rate and measure our progress in order to get to um, a true zero waste as much as we can be NYCHA. And so really making sure that we have the investment um, and the proper infrastructure to uh, establish and track those recycling rates is really critical. So in today's presentation, um, you'll hear from a couple of different folks. Um, Clara Mifflin is from the Center for Zero Waste Design. She'll talk about uh, the Zero Waste Design Guidelines Calculator that was sort of the precedent for our work. Um, you'll hear from Carmelo Frida from DSNY, and he'll talk about the waste characterization studies that feeds into a lot of the assumptions that we work within and updates to those assumptions. Um, you've already heard from me, but I'm the program manager for waste-related capital projects in energy and sustainability at NYCHA. And Juliet Spurt 
Davis and Deb Lopes on my teams, our team uh, are really going to go through the tool and talk about how we created it, what we use it for, and what are some results and improvements that we can make on the tool. And I just outlined this a little bit, but an agenda so everyone's aware. Um, we'll go through the zero waste design guideline calculator, uh, DSMY's waste characterization study, and then nature's waste calculator, why we even have a separate one, and then how do we have better data for better tools for um, city infrastructure and for private developers too, since we all need to think about how do we better manage waste um, and get better waste data. So that's a fun topic for this week. Um, and from there, I'll hand it over to Claire and she'll, she'll get us kicked off. Thanks so much, Katie. So yeah, the Zero Waste Design Guidelines were developed through the Center for Architecture um, here in New York City with involvement from lots of city agencies, Department of Sanitation, DOT, city planning, all had people taking part, part as well as lots of architects, um, building managers, and they really are a comprehensive set of guidelines to answer the question, how can architects and urban designers help the city get to zero waste goals. And they're now being um, taken further um, through the Center for Zero Waste Design, uh, a nonprofit here in the city. So really you have to think about um, how do you plan for, for zero waste? How do you give enough space so whatever is separated there in one can be efficiently moved, can be stored um, separately and collected by truck? And the New York City building code requirement is one and a half square foot per dwelling unit or 350 square foot. Actually, I made an error on this slide, whichever is less. Or if you have a compactor, you can reduce those to one square foot or 300 square foot. Um, next. So you can do an audit if you have a, but if you don't, um, you really need a tool to be able to plan for this. And this is what architects told us, how do I know how much waste my building is gonna generate? So we developed this calculator and Deb, if you can press play, I can talk us through. So you click there, you decide if your building's residential, say, I'm gonna say a 300 unit building. I'm gonna use the average occupancy in New York City. And then you can see how much waste using city averages and how much storage it would require, depending what container you use. Um, we have different capture rates and suggested volume reduction equipment. You'd have to use a trash compactor by code. And as you see, we're 800 square foot, even though code only requires 300 square foot. And if we get rid of all our recycling and we only have trash, that's what code was written for. But if we get better at recycling, because recycling is collected less frequency, frequently, we have a far larger area required, 1,200, four times the amount that the code requires. You can do stuff to improve that, like cardboard balers and even metal and plastic balers, organics, pretreatment. If you add all those things, you could get back to something close to required storage area, but most architects don't do that. You can also... Um, do it for commercial buildings. Here you have to put the amount of um, employees in because that's more proportional to the amount of waste. You could have a lot of takeout, for example. Um, and then again, you get more choices here because you can actually vary the capture rate, the generation rate per stream. Say you um, have a reusables program and all digital printing, you could reduce that. Again, you can choose your containers. You can even select single stream recycling if you like. So that was a very rapid overview of how the calculator works. But yeah, it has some factors that are New York City um, based in terms of say the collection frequency for the residential waste, but it is also meant to be usable elsewhere, especially for the commercial, which is, um, more flexible anyway in the type of containers we use. Um, so yes, if you can take me to the next slide, I'll show you. I hear a lot about how it's, um, oh, that's a, that's gonna run through again, yes. We, we use it a lot in consulting with um, developers, both existing and new buildings, um, where we really have to, it's really difficult because the calculator gives one square foot, but as you can see in these three images, that there's a lot more area required for a low pile on the right 
than for a high pile on the left, especially if you have barriers kind of fencing in that pile. So what area are we giving? And then on the next slide, we see in buildings as well. Um, are you talking about the area to put all the waste in hampers, which is better in terms of moving it in rats? Or are you suggesting that it's stacked up to the ceiling, which you see all over the city for recycling, because recycling is only collected once a week, and most buildings do not have the space to store it. So it's kind of a fact that the better you are at recycling, the more space you need, which is not really what you want to incentivize. And so if we see the next one, when we consult with buildings, we actually use an Excel spreadsheet version of the calculator so we ha can have more nuances. This was a building we were brought in pretty late for um, a new development building. And as you see, they couldn't fit the waste in the compactor room on the right. Um, We've stacked the metal, pl plastic, and glass six foot high, and the trash here. But this is how much space would be needed for the cardboard if they didn't have a baler. So we recommended a baler so they could stack the cardboard here. And this data is way back before COVID. It's 2016 data. So the cardboard has probably doubled or tripled or more since the calculator. But we also show how much space would be required to set it out on the sidewalk. And here, we put it between the two tree pits, four foot high, which is pretty high for a pretty narrow pile because that's average of four foot high. And you only have four foot 10 space here. So really, you have to bail for that too because this isn't really acceptable to have that narrow a path on your sidewalk. Um, we share all the assumptions that the calculator was based on. Basically, we took the annual report of 2016 of DSMY who weigh every truck. So that's very accurate data. We used the 2013 waste characterization study to see what's in that waste. And then we divided it by the number of people in New York City, which is not quite so accurate as there are institutions in that data too. But for commercial, this was the best data we could find, this Cal Recycle data, but it's not half as robust a data set. So that's something we'd love to see more information on. Next. And then when I did the calculator, I remember being told, oh, just use the EPA density to weight conversion factors. I wasn't so familiar with waste at the time. And I thought it would be one number for each stream, but it's not. There's a huge variety of how much weight per cubic yard. And it's just really an amalgamation collection of lots of different studies. And it doesn't come to one recommended amount. So I'm hoping and that the next um, DSMY waste characterization study may include this. We may hear that it's coming up. But yeah, these are the kind of difficulties in the data sets. And of course, organics does vary a lot. It, you might have wet coffee grounds or bones, or you might have compostable packaging. So it is difficult to get to that number. And it will vary depending on the kind of building using it. Um, but yeah, that's a quick overview of the calculator and always feel free to give feedback if people are using it. And I will pass on to the SMI. Okay. Hey, everybody. Can I just get a thumbs up if you can hear me? Fantastic. Great. Cool. Uh, so my name is Carmela Frida. I'm from the New York City Department of Sanitation. And today I'll be talking about the waste characterization study. Uh, so what is a waste study? Uh, waste characterization study is a study that basically determines the composition of our city's waste. Uh, it involves sorting what is collected into material and submaterial categories and really kind of fundamentally answers the question, what is in our waste and how much of it is there? Next. Uh, we need a waste study for a number of reasons. Um, in New York City, we do legally mandated uh, waste characterization studies every five years, which allows us to see the impacts of our programs over time. Um, it helps us understand what people are buying and perhaps even more importantly, what people are throwing out. Um, when we see what's being thrown out, we can also see design trends and packaging and materials um, at really large scales, right? It's kind of really the only way to see uh, the trends uh, kind of in the aftermarket. And really, this helps drive policy questions and really determines what the scope of the study is going to be. So here are the 27, 2017 results. Um, just give you a minute to look at it if you've never seen it before. Um, but Pretty much it's one third compostable, one third recyclable, 
uh, about one third everything else, and about nine percent of that everything else uh, is divertible, whether that be e-waste, household hazardous waste, um, those kind of things. Yeah, so I kind of just talked about this. Um, really, if you take a look at the chart on the bottom, uh, we'll see kind of some good news about waste, which you don't hear too frequently, is that really um, refuse has been going down um, since about 2005 when we first started um, compiling this data and recycling has been going up. And you know, there's an argument to be made that that is partially due to light weighting in the refuse stream, but that's kind of counteracted by the fact that Light weighting is mostly actually happening in the metal glass plastic stream where, you know, glass bottles and heavy kind of metal cans are being replaced with flexible packaging and lighter plastic. So really, you know, this is not just light weighting in the refuse stream, but also real program growth in the recycling stream. So the 2022-2023 waste characterization study is going to contain basically about the same thing that the 2017 did. Um, so we will have main sort categories and subsort categories. We will present data on the residential stream, the NYCHA stream, and the school stream. Uh, the major, major difference is that we will be presenting the data on a density income stratification, and that's something I'll get to in a minute. But first, I want to talk about um, sort and subsort categories and how exactly this works out. So we have 70 material categories. So those are kind of larger groups that we break the entire waste stream down into. So if you just look there on the left, that's an example of uh, six of our uh, paper categories, newspaper, cardboard, high grade paper, mixed low grade paper, non-recyclable and cartons. Um, but if you look on the right, those six categories really just kind of expand into these very, very tiny, extremely minute subcategories that actually, believe it or not, um, answer very, very specific policy questions. So now let me get a little bit into density income stratification. Now this can get a little complicated to so try and follow along. Um, the way density income strata um, works is that we have assigned each district in New York City a certain level of density, low, medium, high, and a certain level of income, low, medium, high, based upon the um, housing density, as well as the building density. And the reason that we are stratifying our results based on that is because we know that those are driving factors of generation. We know they're driving factors of recycling behavior. Basically anything related to waste management in New York City is kind of really driven by those two um, fundamental variables. Um, and we apply it at the district level due to the fact that all of operation, all of our operations are done at the district level. So our decision making as an agency is done at that district level. So we are applying our results um, at that district level. And if you want, you know, just take a second to look at this map. You can find your neighborhood on here. See what we determined you guys to be. Um, as I said, there's about uh, there are nine categories: low density, low income, all the way to high density, high income, and all the intersecting. Um, categories there. So you'll see most of Manhattan is high density, high income. You'll see most of East Queens is low density, high income. You'll see parts of the Bronx, South, South Bronx, high density, low income. Kind of, um, you know, if you look at it, kind of makes anecdotal sense. Some of them might surprise you, but um, generally uh, the data set kind of uh, matches that gut feeling of when you look at a neighborhood on a map. Um, so what are the impacts of this on what the results are going to look like? And perhaps more importantly, relevant to this presentation, uh, NYCHA. So when we did the calculations to determine uh, what a neighborhood was going to be stratified as, um, every single residential household and unit and building is included as part of that calculation. And because of the way that census data is collected, it is quite literally impossible to remove um, those NYCHA residents or those NYCHA households and buildings from that calculation. Um, so because they are included as part of that population, we are also including their results as part of the density income strata results. Um, just want to caveat that and say that we will still have NYCHA specific results. They will just not be um, stratified by density income strata and they will be uh, based on containers that we're able to collect. And I just want to touch very briefly on the multi-unit building study. This is a new component of the waste characterization study. The intention is to measure the volume and weight of curbside waste setouts of 10 plus unit buildings. Um, and the idea is we want to create a model, right? Like we want to measure the waste setouts of a building, how much volume, 
how much weight, how many bags, and really how much space does it take up on the curb? And uh, the model is to kind of answer the question, if a building has a certain number of units and it has these structures, does it have a chute? Does it have an elevator? Um, you know, how many floors is it? How much space is there in the basement? Is there a bailer? Those kinds of things. Um, and based on those um, answers and those in-building unit structures and infrastructure, what are the impacts inside the building on the outside of the curb? And the way we're going to collect this data is not only through uh, DOB and DCP city planning data, but also we're actually going to interview these buildings. We're going to go inside and we're going to ask the supers, hey, um, do you have an elevator, right? Do you put stickers on your bins that tell residents how to recycle? Um, but really, besides kind of that, that in-building survey, if you look at the bottom here, uh, that is a street in Barcelona. And that is kind of the dream, I would say, right? So it is fully containerized, rat-proof bins um, that are separated by metal glass, plastic, paper, refuse, and organics. Um, same as New York City. And really, the intention of the study is to figure out how many of those are we going to need um, if we were to do this in front of multi-unit buildings. What is the volume that we would need? How much space are we going to need? Um, so that's, that's what we're trying to do. Um, and we will hopefully have the results by early 2024. So with all that background, we're going to jump into NYCHA and why a NYCHA waste calculator. So to, for a little bit of context, NYCHA is a city within a city. We have almost 550,000 550, 550, residents in over 177,000 apartments across all five boroughs. You can see the map on the right where we have all our developments. One in 15 New York City residents are NYCHA residents. This is a greater population than cities like Atlanta and Miami. NYCHA is also New York City's largest landlord. And with this immense population, gener NYCHA generates a massive amount of waste, on average 20% more waste than other New York City residents. That comes out to approximately 190,000 tons of waste per year. And putting that into a visual, that's half the weight of Empire State Building every single year. Out of all that waste, we're only recycling 2%. That's, that's still 3,800 tons, but only 2% of our total waste. To put this, and because of this, we developed this calculator. And bearing all in mind, a waste calculator is actually what we need to ensure that projects we're planning meet the waste needs for residents and staff. Zero Waste to Design Guidelines Waste Calculator was the basis for ours. We have adapted it to address NYCHA's specific campus layouts and waste management procedures. The current iteration of our calculator is a straightforward Excel with built-in formulas and assumptions. The data sources that feed our Excel are the Zero Waste Design Guidelines material density and container assumptions that you saw Claire talk about earlier and the sources that she got it from. It's a DSNY's 2017 waste characterization that Carmelo spoke about earlier. And it's DSNY. DSNY also provides NYCHA with tonnage and container collection data from all our containerized waste, but that only present, represents 70% of our portfolio. The rest is curbside set out. We took that containerized collection and analyzed it to normalize and refine our per day generation that you see below this 2.4 pounds per person per day. Other data sources that we use and assumptions are for footprints for our bailers, for cubic yard containers and bags. Um, so, uh, thanks Deb. Designing for waste at NYCHA is uh, a big challenge, um, not just in New York City, but really NYCHA um, specifically. Um, the campuses were not designed for recycling or even for trash collection. Instead, uh, when residents disposed of trash in their chute, it was burned and all that the staff had to manage was ashes. When building incinerators were banned, um, chutes were then retrofit with compactors. Um, and now staff must collect the bags of waste and they have to bring those bags to the curb for collection, um, but two thirds of NYCHA residents live in campuses. Um, and at these sites, um, along with the retrofitting of the chutes, new centralized waste yards were created. Um, and staff uh, are responsible for consolidating that waste from, multi from all the multiple buildings in the campus uh, to the centralized uh, waste yard. Um, when that's where they're collected by DSNY. So this just diagram here describes the process and it also shows the areas that we are now trying to improve. 
For example, creating convenient locations for residents to dispose of recycling. Uh, there's no space uh, in most NYCHA buildings on floors or even often in the lobby, so that area has to be outside. And we're using the calculator to project how much capacity is needed at each building entrance uh, to store recyclables uh, based um, also on our staffing. And here's an example uh, to illustrate how we've adapted the calculated calculator for a campus development. This one um, has seven 16-story buildings. Um, NYCHA residents don't always use the trash chute. Many of the chute doors are small and in disrepair. So residents have started to bring larger bags down to the building entrance. Um, so we've incorporated something we call the chute capture rate, which allows us to um, specify or project the capacity uh, that we need to provide for trash next to the recycling bins. And uh, in, in other words, the amount of uh, trash that's going to come out of the building and that has to be uh, managed um, with the recycling. Um, and that material is uh, going to be lower density, obviously, than the compacted trash. And so we can look at how that lower density material will Im impact the capacity of the trash compactors that we have at the waste yard. Um, without the calculator, designers might just assume one small bin for each stream and call it a day, right? Uh, but with the calculator, we know that if staff are collecting once a day, we will need a lot more capacity than that, and then we can install the proper size receptacles so that they're not overflowing, um, which is really important. Um, so we're also uh, in the process of re-envisioning these centralized waste yards, which as Katie uh, mentioned, were really designed just for trash. Uh, so uh, we're using the calculator to determine the adequate storage for recycling. Um, and we can also use the calculator to determine how many ca compactors are actually needed for trash. Um, something that we don't always think about, but that the trash compactors have a certain capacity and, and it's most efficient and environmentally responsible to uh, fill those compactors you know, to their capacity and not uh, empty them when they're too light. So if you have too many of the compactors, you'll have a tendency to either um, collect them when they're not full or uh, put recycling in them, right, to keep things clean, uh, which we don't want. So uh, we can use the calculator and the design process to uh, make uh, informed decisions um, and also create space for other recycling streams. So sometimes several NYCHA campuses will be managed together as what we call a consolidation. And the calculator allows you to select individual waste streams that are being brought from other developments, um, since not all sites might bring material to a host waste yard. Uh, for example, NYCHA is working with DSNY to pilot the conversion of trash compactors to cardboard compactors at Marcy Houses in Brooklyn and Morris Houses in the Bronx. Um, and uh, neighboring developments can benefit from this compactor, which is really exciting because it makes disposal of cardboard as easy as disposal of trash. No breaking it down, no bundling, no staging, no storing. It just goes right in the cardboard, come into the compactor. So it's very exciting for equal access and for uh, convenience for staff and um, the calculator allows us to project how much capacity we'll need to plan for uh, future clusters. Um, and uh, for example, uh, you know, we can set a certain threshold for an amount of cardboard that we uh, think is uh, we would want to see generated in a cluster and then decide that we um, that was where we should locate a, a compactor. Thanks, Juliet. So with this calculator, not uh, so we're from the energy and sustainability team, but there's multiple departments at NYCHA that have used this calculator. Examples are the real estate team and the waste management and pest control department. As Julia said, we've used it for our waste yard redesign projects. 
We've looked at it for recycling centers and cardboard compactors. Real estate has used provided the tool to pack developers for them to determine the necessary upgrades to their waste infrastructure. And the waste management and pest control team has inputted the information from these calculators into their integrated waste management plans that they've provided to all developments and consolidations. So here I'm going to do, I'm going to show the video um, of the brief overview of our development side of our calculator and next the consolidation. And I'm not going, I'm going to just talk and just let the video loop because I didn't time it out that well. So it comes in multiple steps. So we tried to develop it for ease of use. It's also going to zoom in. I do know it's far away. So right now, the first step you do is you select the development. So in the main development uh, tab, you can only select one development. From there, you get to see the population of that development, the daily generation, the weekly generation, and how many stair halls that development has. The second step is you want to change the capture rate. So we provided a guide on the right that shows the current NYCHA capture rate, the NYCHA minimum, the city average, and the max diversion. So for our waste yard redesign projects, we use the city average rate that I have up here, which is the 50%, 79%. The third, the third step is you want to look at the trash and recycling daily collection. So this is where we look at the stair hall level. First, you'll have to put in the capture rate uh, for the trash chute capture rates. Right now we have 75%, but you can adjust that from anywhere as low as zero, no trash chute usage, or 100%, 100%. After, you can look at the stair hall level. You'll, can, you can only input the maximum amount of stair halls for that development. You'll get an error if you go above. So for this example, if you put eight, you'll get an error. And then after you can put in the container type for the trash that you'd like to set out the collection. So you can have a one cubic yard container, a two cubic yard container, or even gallon carts. You can also do the same for recycling. And then after that, you'll look at the storage. And I can bring it down here, right here. Right here, you are able to select the number of pickups per week or the number of compactors that you would like um, to have in your waste yard. And this is looking at a weekly generation. And this is only for trash and cardboard because that's the only containerized um, materials that we have at NYCHA. You get to, right now, if looking at the pickups per week, if you have it at one, you'll see the number of compactors you need. And here at the for the cardboard, we have it set every biweekly and you'll see that you need to um, have a, a baler. From here, it'll show the, um, you'll, you can also input the types of containers you want for your recycling, which is metal glass plastics and paper. And also show you for a cardboard baler, if that's what we're recommending for your development to have. And then the last step is just a summary of how many compactors you need, how many bales your development would generate if you have a baler, how many bags of recycling that you'll generate per week, and what that translates as a footprint. And then next we'll look at a so next slide. Next, you can look at it as a consolidation. So here you can select your host development. And for example, I'll be showing Marcy for our cardboard clusters, and you can select the developments that feed to that feed to that host site. So right now we have, I'm showing two examples, 303 Vernon and Sumner, all in Brooklyn. And from here, similar to the development calculator, you'll see the tons generated per week, per day, the population, the number of stair halls. And then this consolidation tab, you get to see, you get to input if it's being what waste is being transferred to the host development. You get to select yes, no, and then that'll feed to the larger generation on the right. And if it's transferring trash over, you have to input your trash chute usage because that determines how much uh, volume is in your containerized waste. And similar to the development calculator, you'll see the generation per day for the host development, but you also see it for the whole consolidation and you get to change the capture rate as well. So similar to the development calculator, you'll look at the storage that you for that consolidation and for um, for the cardboard clusters, this is where the cardboard compactors really come into play and um, you can see how frequently it has to be picked up per day and similar to the development, you'll get the square foot of the um, of what you need at the host development. 
So now that I showed you the calculator, I'll just talk about areas of improvement that we'd like to see to make this better and easier to use for the future. So key areas of improvement, um, really focusing on data. Um, so bulk waste makes up 12.5% of nitrous waste and it's a critical component to understand a development storage needs but it's not a part of our waste calculator at the moment. With this data, we can properly determine to space requirements and analyze generation to help out programs like our current programs, like the mattress recycling program. We'd also like to refine our assumptions using actual data. So I talked about our DSNY containerized data before, and that makes up that 2.4 pounds per person per day assumption that we have. Right now we're only using DSNYs uh, 2017 data that we have, but we have data from 2018 to 2021 that we haven't analyzed um, fully yet to incorporate into the data or into the data stream. So once we do that, that 2.4 pounds per person per day assumption will be refined and, and tweaked. Additionally, um, we use the 2017 waste characterization, characterization study composition breakdown for nitro refuse. With the new 2022 um, waste refuse, that will be greatly changed because as you've noticed during the pandemic, waste has greatly changed, particularly if we look at cardboard. Online shopping has increased um, so that 14% of paper, cardboard and paper, I, I know would, um, would change. So now we'll move on to the questions portion. Um, first, we'll go into questions that we have in the chat, but we also have a series of questions and prompts that we developed for. And I see that there's 25 messages in the chat, so I'll, I'll go through them in order. I've been tracking the questions, Deb, so I can okay. go through some of them. Awesome. And some of them are just snarky comments. <laughs> <laughs> snarky comments and shameless plugs, which we love. Um, so I think the, the first question was understanding the 2024 timeline for the DSMY, I think just the multi-use family building or Carmelo, maybe you can clarify if that's for both the waste characterization and the multifamily uh, building. That is for both. And uh, there's a number of reasons why it's going to take so long. Um, a, it is a going to be a multi-season study. Um, so just the nature of time, right? Like it's going to take a year, no matter what, um, because we want to get, um, every season, um, we're actually going to do three seasons, but we're, we're capturing the, um, the fullness of the waste stream regardless. Um, and then, you know, it, it's a lot of data to go through. Um, there are quite literally going to be thousands of samples, um, this time around. It's a huge study with nine, um, density income stratas, each of them statistically significant. Um, so it's just a lot of data to write through and, you know, a, a lot of people get, um, have to have their input and analyses. So it, it takes a while. Thanks. Um, the next question was about the, the, the slide from Barcelona or image from Barcelona that you shared. And they asked why not underground bins? Um, and I can answer this one and maybe if you want to, Carmel, weigh in. Um, we're definitely considering underground bins. Um, you know, there's a, a whole can of worms when you open up a street in New York City. Um, if you ever see a construction site, I highly recommend like peeking through and seeing uh, all of the layers of things that are down there. So um, going underground is definitely a really great option, um, but it has to be really strategic. Otherwise, it could be a, an astronomical cost. Um, so it's definitely something we're considering. Um, and Juliet put in the chat, we have a link to a request for information from container manufacturers and haulers who would be interested in uh, participating in a pilot for NYCHA for either above ground, semi-submerged or fully submerged containers. Um, so we're definitely considering options. Um, and I know that DSMY, DOT, all other parties involved when you touch a, a, a New York City street would be considering that as well and all the different considerations there. And, and um, to add, I, I think there's some difficulty also in that where those containers would be the most valuable is where they are most difficult to place. So if you think of, you know, like a really busy commercial strip with a bunch of, you know, high rises where tens of thousands of people live on a block, um, there is an immense amount of underground street infrastructure, pipes, subway infrastructure. I mean, you, you can name it, right? But somewhere like, you know, Staten Island, where it's like single family homes, there's not a lot of underground infrastructure, but there's really not a 
huge need for containerization there. Um, so it, it's a matter of priorities and competing interest uh, for the curb and underground. Yeah, and Can we've actually taken a little look at that for a project we're looking at, which is like 1,600 units on one city block on 24th Street. And we would have to have 70% of the length of the block filled up with those containers to accommodate all the waste. Because if you think about Barcelona, it's a consistent density, much less than our high density areas. So in, in some cases, that wouldn't be the answer, but you could maybe have smaller wheeled bins taken directly to the truck. So you don't have anything in the curb lane. But yeah, sorry, just piping in there. I think yep. they definitely have a place in some neighborhoods, though. And like Carmelo said, the ones with um, retail on the ground floor, maybe three or four stories above, like Chinatown, they would be so great, where there's really no space on the sidewalk for setting out waste. Carmelo, you mentioned in your presentation it would take till 2024 to do some type of data analysis. Did I get that right? Um, I'd like to just hear, like, what was that data analysis and, and why um, till 2024? Uh, the data analysis involves uh, kind of cross-referencing the policies that we are actually trying to address, right? So we have about 350 material categories and looking at almost each and every single one of those 350 material subcategories and saying, you know, what is the percentage of this or what is, you know, how much uh, waxed coated paper is there? This is just use an example, right? How much wax coated paper is there compared to unwaxed coated paper, right? In the paper stream and the refuse stream. And that answers a bunch of questions related to, um, you know, recyclability. Wax cardboard isn't as recyclable as unwaxed cardboard. Um, how much ends up in the refuse stream? How is our outreach doing for that type of capture? Um, and we have to do that 350 times. Uh, so it's, it's a very in-depth analysis that there are a lot of stakeholders involved, right? It's, it's not just DSNY, but it's also a lot of outside groups and, you know, packaging manufacturers and, and people who are, you know, in the design space for material consumer goods. Um, the next question in the chat was about the multifamily building study and how many buildings will be part of it. It was answered in the chat, but just so everyone sees it, um, it's approximately 160. Um, and there's some back and forth in the chat also that I think I'll read through at the end if we have time. Um, the next question in the chat was, can DSMY collect or incorporate bulk waste data in the new study? I think that's a really good question. Um, so bulk is technically, um, you know, bulk is included um, as part of the refuse stream. So DSMY uh, collects bulk um, curbside as we do regular um, waste with the refuse stream. Um, so whenever we sample something, um, so usually what happens is we collect a 200 pound sample of, of black bags for the refuse stream. But when it comes to bulk, um, this is a little complicated to answer, but the way that we sample, we kind of um, pick direct areas of a whole load. Um, and if there is a bulk item as part of that load, we estimate the weight as to what percentage of the total load that we are sampling is bulk. Um, a little bit of art, a little bit of math, but bulk is included as part of our residential refuse um, calculations. And I'm assuming you would categorize whatever like that bulk material is, is as its own category. So like if there's furniture, there'd be some wood components, there'd be yep. some fabric components, Correct. refrigerators. Yeah, have, there's, yeah. a, um, there's a bulk rigid plastic category. There are plenty of construction and demolition categories, uh, you know, mattresses that all, I would say just about every bulk, every bulk category is, is covered. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that this is true. All the subsort categories are in the 2017 waste characterization results that are on open data. So people can go and explore that. Correct. Cool. Um, the next question in the chat was, where and how do you measure rat populations at NYCHA? Um, is it through 311 complaints? Uh, it, it, there, we definitely source through 311. Um, we have a, a partnership with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene uh, that also do counts of boroughs. Um, and I think some of that data is on open data. I'm not sure how, exactly how much of it is, but um, there, there are counts. And then we also field 311 complaints. 
Um, and uh, we also have a, a My NYCHA app for NYCHA residents where they can report instances of infestations for various pests. Um, so we have data that way too. Um, the next question in the chat was, do you track how well the waste calculator model performs after it's used for a given site? Claire, you started to answer that in the chat. Do you just want to talk to it? Yes. I mean, a lot of architects have used it for buildings that are then going to be constructed. So it's a long time scale. Architects are not normally then working on the building after it's been constructed. So and we don't know the data to track that. But we are working with some existing buildings where we are trying to then kind of guess what the capture rates are based on what we're counting as put it put out on the curb but it would be great to to validate it and hopefully i mean i'm very excited about this multi-unit study because that could be something when that those results came out that we could look at to to improve upon the calculator as i kind of tried to show in that two minutes there are so many variables from density factors to capture rates to generation rates to the containers that are put into the equipment that it's that it, yeah it would be great to have some validation yeah and i guess on our side um we're just getting started with our first uh waste yard renovations that have the calculator feeding into the space appropriation um, but for the cardboard compactors, like we do have estimates of how much we should be seeing um, and what should be collected at the sites. And that kind of gives us an estimate of what the recycling rate is. Um, it really is dependent on how well the staff participate and how uh, much we actually get collection from all of the different sites that are feeding into the one, um, because we're assuming like the full volume of cardboard that would be going into the compactors. Um, so our, I think our average rates are around 20% um, at the sites with the cardboard compactors. And um, that may be because we um, aren't getting the, the right staffing procedures and participation there. Um, there are a lot of different factors that could be weighing in, um, but we are trying to use it as a baseline for at least creating um, accountability for what we are installing and trying to come up with a recycling rate, which um, is really hard to have when it's all curbside collection. Um, the next question in the chat was, how are you tracking waste between waste characterization studies? Are you getting weights from your trash collection vendors or using your own scales? Um, Deb, do you wanna speak about the DSNY data? Uh, so our DSNY data that we get is from our containerized um, sites. So when I say containerized, it's the um, it's the compactors. I can go back to uh, one of the slides that has it. Um, so 70% of our portfolio is containerized. So this one is converted to a cardboard and paper, but that's what I mean when I say a, a compactor. So DSNY picks that up and we get reports of, of the how much that container weighed when it was picked up, how many containers they picked up on that day. Um, and we get it on a yearly basis. Now there is a Power BI um, system that DSNY is feeding in monthly. So it's... Um, we're able to analyze that more, but it's only for 70% of our portfolio. There are a multitude of sites that are strictly curbside. So that's why we're using that 2.4 pounds per person per day assumption to get the whole NYCHA waste generation for the entire year. And Carmela, I don't know if you wanted to weigh in on that at all or no. Um, pretty much hit the nail on the head for NYCHA, um, but I would just say for for residential, um, you know, we, we do the study every five years, but for kind of weights and tonnages in between, yeah, it comes from our own trucks and scales. Thanks. Um, the next question in the chat was, uh, will there be changes to the waste calculator data given Mayor Adams' recent announcement of cutting funding for curbside composting? Um, I'm going to say no. <laughs> uh, we still have to manage our organics. Um, and it's a really heavy part of the waste stream. Um, so it's definitely a huge consideration, especially when we have to think about pest management at NYCHA as well. Um, and he has proposed uh, stopping expansion. I don't think that there's like a true stop to the program yet. Um, so it's definitely still a factor. It's definitely still a, a third of our waste stream. Um, so we still need to be thinking about how do we manage it appropriately. Yeah, and on our side, you can vary the slider for how much organics you capture. So 
I mean, lots of places were at zero anyway, didn't have access to, to pick up. So it doesn't change that. You can still adjust. Right, right. The capture rate could be zero for sites where it's not available. Um, the next question was, how can DSNY implement any curbside or street waste container program without effective upstream, upstream waste policy, such as EPR? Um, and what would be the timeline on that? I don't know, Carmel, if you want to take this or any. <laughs> yeah. Wait a second. Uh, <laughs> what did I do here? Uh, well, okay. Uh, suddenly I'm seeing myself on screen, but whatever. Uh, yep. So way above my pay grade. I'll say that. <laughs> um, basically, yeah. So, you know, they're right. The, the person who put that comment in the chat box, um, you know, right now there is just an enormous amount of waste that's generated in this city. Um, partially due to the fact that, you know, we have no control over what's actually generated. Um, so, you know, if we can hold packaging manufacturers more accountable in what they design and what actually flows into our city and ends up in our waste stream, um, the goal is really that eventually that volume and that weight will reduce. Timeline? I don't know. Talk to your state senators. <laughs> yes. Um, the next question was, will this presentation be available on YouTube or any other platform? Noel? Yes, it will be. Uh, give us a few weeks um, and we're going to be processing all of these videos. Uh, there is one question I have following up on that is the making the, the waste calculator video more presentable. Could I send that to you to upload to, video, to YouTube as well? Just having a absolutely. better. Yeah, um, absolutely. We're going to have someone it. go go through the videos and edit out the ums and the ahs and <laughs> um, make sure that everybody sounds the most intelligent. So um, send me your presentation and the video and we will we will put it as an interstitial. Thank okay, you. great. No problem. Perfect. Um, and a lot, the last one, I think that's pretty relevant for the calculator is the assumption of the 2.4 pounds per person per day um, as a standard that seems high. Um, this was based on data in 2017. I think as Carmela said, it, it varies a lot as the waste stream changes. Um, but until we have, I, or I think actually rather I'll hand this over to Deb because she's been working on comparing that assumption with some data that we're getting from DSMY and how do we better at least reformulate our calculator to be more realistic. Yeah. So, uh, Basing it off that, um, just want to reiterate that NYCHA residents do produce more waste on average than the average New York City resident. Um, and they are um, multifamily, multi-generational households. So that population that I stated there might not be the true accurate representation of a NYCHA, um, uh, the NYCHA population. So the waste that we are uh, that 2.4 pounds per person per day, um, what we did, what I did do is I looked at the 2017 data for the for the containerized sites, and that was almost a normalization. So for some sites, it is it might be a little bit high, and for some some sites, it might be a little, a little bit low. But it was comparing it to the whole overall portfolio, and was the normalization. And as as we as I and the people on my team or like the waste team here look at the 2018, 2019 and so on data that might change and might lower. Like Carmel said, that waste generation in the city has dropped. And um, I don't know what the pandemic uh, will do to that for the 2020 data will do, but it um, that number should be refined as we, uh, as we go on. Um, I also know that NYCHA typically has more people per household than the rest of the city. So that's yeah. another factor in terms of like household consideration. And the 2.4 pounds is for all waste streams. It's not just garbage. Um, yeah. So that feeds into like all of the generation for all the different waste streams that we have. Um, a part of that was pay as you throw slash save as you throw. Um, a very interesting a question and consideration in the, the context of New York City um, that I, I think not we're not quite the people to answer that unless Clara you want to talk about any sort of <laughs> just agree yeah <laughs> agree yeah. we need it <laughs> yeah um so we are a little over our hour um I think that covered all the questions that are in the chat um except for Juliet but Juliet but 
just, a, <laughs> just a quick plug for density uh, factors from DSNY. I think just because we're using CalRecycle and EPA, and as Claire mentioned, the factors are are not great, and you know that's really how we're determining the volume. So it's great to hear about the. Um, the uh, curbside density study, but it sounds like that study won't actually give a density factor necessarily. So if there's some way to, you know, just measure those truckloads, the uh, volumes as you're weighing them, uh, that would be great. It's probably, you know, a little more complicated than that, but. I, I don't want to take up too much more time because I know we're over. Um, we're going to be measuring the volume of the, the per stream. Um, so we'll know how much volume is curbside recycling taking up, how much volume is refuse taking up. We unfortunately, it's a little operationally difficult, I'll say, to get a per material volume. Um, but, you know, we're, we're almost there. No, that's per wonderful. Stream. Per stream yeah. is good enough. Perfect. Yeah, you don't need per material because we, yeah, we don't need that. that yeah. Way. The stream is wonderful for architects and nature. <laughs> and I do want to, one last plug before we leave is if you have any feedback, any notes on our calculator and how we can improve, that's what we're looking for, how to make it better for our users, especially before we make it public. I know that's one comment here. Is this waste calculator public? No, it's not, but that is our goal. Awesome. The other Center for Zero Waste Design calculator is public, so you can play around with that one and then give us your feedback on uh, what you saw today. Awesome. Thank you so much for all of your time and energy and your work uh, cleaning up after all New Yorkers. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, this, without a doubt, has been one of the most fascinating conversations of Open Data Week for myself, and I've been attending quite a few of them. So.